We are live. Welcome to Review and Thoughts, Spider-Man No Way Home. Before I go really far into this, it kind of bothers me when other people put cool stuff in the background of their video and then you never get a good look at it, so I'm just going to go ahead and see. You've got The Amazing Spider-Man 1 and Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse. Those are probably going to be behind the back of my head for the rest of the video, so... But now you know. I realize this video is long. I'm going to do what I can to make it worth your time. Also, if you're only interested in the review, that part of the video is not the whole length of the video. See its length, check the time codes in the description box. I watched this in a theater because where I live, COVID is under control. If you do not live in an area where COVID is under control, please do not watch this in a theater. No movie is worth risking spreading COVID. Even if you think you yourself will be safe, there's probably someone you might accidentally spread it to that you don't want to spread it to. I am currently dealing with some back pain, but I still have a lot to say about the movies that I watch. So I'm going to speak faster until my back feels better. I'm going to real quick say... You know, given given that it's that the movie has all this stuff from other Spider-Man movies, you know, there there are a couple of things that I wanted to you know reassure right off the bat. There are a lot of references to the other movies, but somehow not too many. Like if 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 you didn't watch the movie and I just told you. You know, this is the number. You'd probably be like, "That's that's just too much." But you know, and if they cut very many of them, it would end up feeling like too little. The movie doesn't take away the like the hard-earned things from those movies. There's some great character moments and character actions for every single character that you know in in this. No, no one goes forgotten. Now, I start this video with a read where if I spoil anything, I will verbally warn before I do so and hold up an index finger until I'm done with the spoiler so you can mute and skip ahead and choose to see me lower my index finger. Also, please note, I will not warn before spoilers for earlier entries in the MSU franchise and other Spider-Man movies since, you know, if, if you watch this movie you know, parts of those will be spoiled anyway. But as soon as I end the review itself, please note the rest of the video will have lots of spoilers. And I will be discussing the ending in the thoughts sections. I don't have any personal issues with almost any filmmakers, and I almost never let any issues I might have interfere with my review and analysis. So, given that this brings back stuff from other Spider-Man movies it is relevant to briefly I'm, I'm gonna briefly talk about how I feel about the various Spider-Man movies. Sam Raimi's trilogy does a really good job of taking the comic book and putting it on the screen. He brings his strong sense of visuals and his willingness to embrace material that is more comic booky than a lot of mainstream audiences were expecting when he put out the first one. He definitely is the best of the three directors handling the three solo Spider-Man series at handling something so big and comic booky, The Amazing Spider-Man 1 does a good job of being gritty, while the second one definitely gets too excited about setting up upcoming movies, fitting in a lot of different subplots like Raimi Spider-Man 3. I personally prefer the MCU movies. I think they do a good job of bringing in elements that we didn't get in the first two series. Tony Stark as a mentor when he's been without a help, the mentor himself was interesting. Uh, Peter Parker with different problems who exist in the same world as the Avengers is interesting, in my opinion. Spider-Verse is brilliant. The visuals, Easter eggs, characters, multiverse aspect, love it. Best Spider-Man solo movie until Far From Home came out. So, Spider-Man 1, 2, and 3 get a 7 out of 10 for me. The Amazing Spider-Man 1 and 2 both get an 8 out of 10 for me. Civil War is a perfect 10 out of 10. Homecoming is an 8. Venom is a 7, Spider-Verse a 10, Far From Home an 8, Avengers 3 and 4 are both 10 out of 10, Venom 2 is a 7. And yeah, 
I love every MCU movie. They're all in the 7 out of 10 to 10 out of 10 range, although I don't make any excuses for Iron Man 2. And I love every episode that's come out so far of the Disney Plus MCU shows. So, you know, 10 out of 10 for WandaVision, Captain America and the Winter Soldier, Season 1 of Loki, Season 1 of What If, and the episodes of Hawkeye that have aired. So, you know, the first five. Now, there are several major appeals of comic books and uh, their adaptations. One is they can have many wild concepts on play on each other. Magic Power versus Robots, for example. And yeah, this has that. And with their wild concepts, they can give compelling commentary on real issues with greater efficiency than non-comic stuff. I think this one also does a good job of that, yes. And let's see. The... There are... Hmm. So, personally, I don't mind for people who aren't big fans of comic book and comic book adaptations to review them and comment on them, but I know for some people it is very important for it to only be fans, so... Yeah, I'm a big fan of Spider-Man. I read the comics between 1999 and 2007. I stopped right before One More Day. I guess my Spidey sense, or rather my Spidey's about to have a terrible story sense, was tingling. And no, I haven't only read the stuff that came out in between. I've, I've read a bunch of classic Spider-Man. I read Spider-Man and Superman and various... Yeah. Yeah, the, the book... Yeah, you, you can't tell from just looking at it, but the book, yeah, that book has like, the it, it's like the, the Marvel editors went through all of the Spider-Man stories and picked the most iconic and memorable ones, and I have read all of the stories in that one multiple times. Now, content warning and or trigger warning. ableism, gaslighting, mental illness, body horror, and yeah. Now, So yeah, the movie is rated PG-13, and so is this video. This video is not going to contain any clips of any kind. Most visual gets is when I sometimes act something out, so feel free to watch something visual, such as clips on this movie in another tab. I won't mind. Now, I'm probably going to say some negative things in this video. I want to assure that it's not out of bitterness. I don't feel like the movie wasted my time. Nobody forced me to watch it or to make this video. It's not that I'm upset how it compares to what it's adapting. Other movies like it, what I was expecting, trailers and other marketing. Other movies in the franchise. I don't have some personal vendetta against anyone who worked on making it to the best of my ability. The negative things I said in this video are for criticism based on budget, when it came out, what are trying to achieve, etc. So... So yeah, technically you don't 100% need to have watched the non-MCU. Like, if you try to watch this and you don't know the MCU Spider-Man, you're going to be lost. It's There's just too much. But it does technically give just enough information about the non-MCU Spider-Man stuff. But I would definitely recommend you should not... This should not be the first time you meet any of the characters that reappear. So yeah, you should have, before you watch this movie, and you should definitely watch this movie, if you if you are even the tiniest bit fascinated by the character of Spider-Man, you should definitely watch this movie. But yeah, before you do so, make sure to watch the Sam Raimi Spider-Man trilogy, both of the Amazing Spider-Man movies, you do not need to have watched the Venom movies. Although... How do I, how do I cover this without spoiling anything? 
you don't need to, but there is maybe a thing or two that will make more sense if you have. But if you haven't, you know, there are YouTubers who've got you covered. But this should def the the there's so much meaningful stuff with the characters who return from other Spider-Man movies. This should not be the first time you yeah. Now. Since we're still dealing with Corona, I want to say during this video, it's possible that I will touch my face. I want to assure you, I washed my hands since the last time I was outside, and I will wash my hands again before going out. Um, let's see, I'm just gonna. Hmm. I swear I'm not gonna spend forever dealing with this thing, but I just gotta. There we go. Much better. Okay, so yeah, I have only watched this movie once. I look forward to watching it again. Probably not going to be in a movie theater, but yeah. So, plot. As of the post credit scene of Far From Home, everyone knows that Peter Parker is Spider-Man and a significant chunk of people believe that he murdered the hero, Mysterio. So Peter talks to Doctor Strange about a spell that will remove people's knowledge that he is Spider-Man, but something goes wrong, and the... I guess I will just leave it at that. Yes. Now, I think it was Cosmo Variety Hour who pointed out that you know, this is actually the first Spider-Man movie where a lot of the general public think that Spider-Man is like a bad guy. It happens all the time in the comics, so I'm I'm really glad they found you know he was as well. Really glad that they finally got to that. Now. I've watched Into the Spider-Verse twice. The other ones I've watched probably at least a half a dozen times each. And yeah, for the for the solo ones, I haven't watched like let's see. Infinity War and Endgame, I I'm not one hundred percent sure. I think Infinity War by now four times and Endgame twice. And Civil War seven I think I I find it difficult to stop watching that movie I I kinda take any excuse to like you know oh there's another movie featuring Ant-Man coming out yeah I'll, I'll watch Civil War again oh WandaVision is coming to Disney Plus time to watch Civil War again so yeah now let's see. So yeah, for those who don't know, I watch and video review pretty much every single comic book adaptation movie that goes to theaters. And yeah, so I was always going to, to watch this, but this is one of the cases where I was really looking forward to and might have chosen to watch it even if it wasn't something I was already going to watch. Like this is like, so you've got, you know, they're, they're taking elements from the, ah, crap, I just mentioned it earlier. I swear I'm not going to spend forever. If I can't remember, I'll move on. One more day. They take elements from one more day, and I want to say, what is, was it called? Happy birthday or something like that. And they're, they're tackling the idea of everyone knowing that Peter Parker is Spider-Man, which you know, his identity has come out in the comics. And, you know, like, in the comics, it actually, his identity is revealed. He reveals it intentionally for the Civil War, you know, storyline. So I've basically been waiting for this kind of movie since 
the movie Civil War, you know, where he did not reveal his... Which I'm really glad, because it's such... I get it. I, I get what they were going for, but it's just not a very good... Like, secret identities in superhero fiction just makes sense. You know, and saying everyone now has to give away their secret identity, it's just ridiculous. Like, it's one thing if you want to say, okay, so there's this government institution they have access to the information about. So, so like, you know, let's say that Mysterio goes out and does something horrible. This government agency can, like, open their files and, like, okay, Mysterio. Oh, Mysterio, that's Quentin Beck. Here's his address. Here's a list of his known associates. Fine. But saying that everyone in the world should know who they are, that's just ridiculous. Anyway. Now, some of the marketing shows there are people who've written on walls or posters, you know, believe Mysterio. Since Mysterio was in the movie one of the many cases since 2016 and onwards where the villain was Donald Trump, represented one of the couple of negative things about Donald Trump. Countless. Countless. Nail yeah. In the case of Mysterio, him tricking people into thinking he's not... You know, out for his own gain. Believe Mysterio, people must be equivalent to QAnon. So it is a little unfortunate that they weren't able to get a movie out about QAnon before Trump left office. But then, you know, if let's see, yeah, if Mysterio either doesn't show up in the movie or only shows up in a weakened state, and QAnon is still going strong. That might actually represent the reality of a post-Trump presidency. Right, so, in that case, I guess it is kind of perfect. Now, let's see. I wasn't sure how they were going to be able to keep this movie from being ridiculously overstuffed. It, I'm, I'm amazed that they did. Like, this is not the first time. Like... From Spider-Man, as of and including Sam Raimi's Spider-Man 3, the only of these, of the Spider-Man solo movies that didn't basically have enough villains for a Sinister Six, or was trying really hard to set up Sinister Six, the only one of them is the first Amazing Spider-Man. That one does only have the one villain. The Amazing Spider-Man 2 has three villains and hints that there will be more. And, yeah. Did I phrase that right? Yeah, and the uh, Spider-Man 3 didn't have enough for a Sinister Six, but they were building toward, you know, they, yeah, there were too many villains. You know, three in a movie that at most could have sustained two. And... Let's see, but but yeah, you know, Homecoming, a lot of them just only, like, they don't, they don't put on a suit and they don't make a big deal out of it, but yeah, you know, you've got the Tinkerer, you've got Vulture, you've got at least two Shockers, and technically, I forget the character name, but Miles' uncle is technically playing the Prowler, you know, he is technically the Prowler, he just doesn't, he doesn't suit up. Or anything, and then you have a pre suit scorpion, so that's enough for a Sinister Six. And Far From Home has the Elementals and Mysterio, yeah, you know. So, I, I'm shocked. I'm, I, if you had told me, like, if you, if you touched Wonder Woman's lasso of truth. You looked me right in the eye and you said, 100%, I guarantee you, No Way Home is not an overstuffed movie. I I would have been, that, that lasso is lying. That is not just, I, I swear, I'm going to move on now. But I just want, you know, it's, it's, it's amazing to me. I, I, 
I'm not saying that the MCU never makes a mistake, and I do realize that Sony has a lot of influence on the solo movies, you know, the Spider-Man solo movies in the MCU, but it's just, it's amazing how they're just so much better at this than, than pretty much every other, like, I still have a lot of love for a lot of the Fox X-Men movies, but I'm way more, I have way higher hopes now that the MCU is going to start doing X-Men, and... I maintain that there's a lot of great stuff in the DCEU, although I do think they they do better when they're not trying to do overarching continuity. Anyway. Now, let's see. I mean, they literally, they... Uh, let's take my spoiler. Okay, I'll move on. Now, so let's see the, yeah, the, a lot of the Spider-Man solo movies have Peter with a mentor. I think this movie does uh, an okay job exploring Peter's relationship with his mentor in this movie, Doctor Strange. And I wrote a lot of stuff where it just, yeah, I don't need to go into all that. Yeah, I, I think the movie fixed One More Day, the way that Endgame fixed, I forget what the storyline is called in the, the comic, but, you know, Steve saying Hail Hydra. Now, some people take issue with the trailer showing Doctor Strange being very cavalier about a dangerous spell. I suppose they, they figure that while it is a weird course of action, it is not a strange thing to do, like the kind of thing strange would do. Yeah, we gotta explain the joke. Never mind. I've seen some say that considering that Peter saved the world in Endgame, you know, people wouldn't hate him after he apparently killed one hero. You know, if the majority of people now hate Peter, then it's like, that doesn't really make sense. But I wouldn't really say, like, in the movie, it's basically everyone knows, you know, everyone has accepted that Peter is Spider-Man, but not, you know, far from everyone. There's, there's a chunk of people who believe that he killed Mysterio. And, yeah, I mean, that's kind of like how like, QAnon, despite, like, you know, everything points to Trump being perfectly happy to be around Jeffrey Epstein, Marjorie Taylor Greene, Marjorie Greene supports Matt Gates. you know, like, the, 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 yeah, when when clearly, you know, yeah, Matt Gates and Jeffrey Epstein are pedophiles, and and yeah, you know, they they don't need actual logical reasoning to believe that about someone. Now, I've seen some say there's no reason for Peter to freak out that. Aunt May and MJ will forget about him being Spider-Man, just tell them again. I agree, but he is a teenager. You know... A teenager currently making decisions based on emotion. He does plenty of things across these movies that if he sat down and thought about them, he would realize that he's letting his emotions overpower his reasons. I, I really don't... I think that's just consistent writing. Like, it, it's completely... Like, I get if that frustrates you, 100% I understand that, but there's not... That, yeah, that's just, that's a big part of the character. Now... Apparently this movie was a mess production-wise. I've, um... 
Sean Chandler talks about, I think is the name of the channel, and his his videos, Five Reasons Spider-Man No Way Home Could Suck, and like, I I was actually a little bit worried, that, and, and I, I guess, honestly, I think I can, you know, I could probably point to a couple of things in this movie that's like, okay, that was not supposed to, that wasn't originally supposed to be like that. That is a rewrite, and that, you know, or a reshoot or something. But it really, it just, it works. Like, there's, there's the MCU are so good at this. It's, it's wild. Now, I was worried that the movie would be too nostalgia, baby. And when when you bring that up, obviously that does you know bring up. Yes, it worked on me. I was like, "Wow, that's that character I know and care about because of those other movies." It it did. It worked on me. I was one hundred percent like, "Yeah." Now. I, it's amazing to me that the, the movie manages, I was worried it was going to be Sam Raimi Spider-Man 3 over stuff. I, it's, you know, it seems like as long as Sony has a say in it, the third Spider-Man solo movie in a continuity is going to have more superpowered people than the first two. I, I don't, it's, it's, I mean, I could, I could, pick it apart and say, okay, so this is why, like, yeah, just off the, like, one of the big things is that there is a, there's an important relationship between the, the characters in this that are brought in from other movies, you know, where one of the problems Spider-Man 3 has is that it basically, like, these three villains have different motivations and different goals you know there at the end it's like okay I guess a couple of them can team up against Spider-Man then Harry can help out Spider-Man but they don't really and and in this they they realize that, that would be a problem and it, uh, to be fair you know it's it's easier it's easier to learn from other people's mistakes than it is to realize you're making a mistake as it is and and Sam Raimi himself has come out and said Spider-Man 3 not my best work but yeah like the there is a distinct there's a reason why yeah I'm gonna I'm gonna go into it in the spoiler sections but anyway the writing so this was written by Chris McKenna and Eric Sommers, who also wrote Far From Home and Homecoming and Ant-Man and the Wasp together. So, yeah, and, and the, yeah, I'm going to quote one of my fellow critics here. The first and second acts are very messy, but the third act pulls it together to pack one hell of an emotional punch. Now, so yeah, with the whole multiverse thing, the, you know, the movie has a concept that requires explaining. You can't just drop it on people and just, that's it, you know. And the movie does an incredible job explaining, like, it could very easily just get bogged down, just spend forever explaining but it actually does a really good job like it you get a little bit of information just just enough that you can follow what's and then just yeah a, if, it should not work but it does and the direction is still handled by John Watts he directed all three movies in this trilogy, and he is 
directing Fantastic Four, which, I mean, considering these three, yeah, I'm I'm really looking forward to. He does a really good job. Like I think Homecoming is probably the one that felt the most like okay, this is the movie he wanted to make. You know, it is a John Hughes movie feature but the lead is spider-man you know that's and and that was definitely something you know i it's not that i think that he like he, you do get a sense of his passion in far from home and no way home as well but for sure that was like you know if he could make at least one mcu movie he really wanted to do john hughes with spider-man and I think, you know, for sure there are some things about Far From Home. I would say, you know, whenever he's dealing with teenage drama, whether friendship or, you know, love complications and such, romantic complications, that's some of the stuff that he really yearns to, he loves handling that. I think in this one, it you know, he does a better job on the other stuff as well, but, you know, all three have really great stuff when it comes to just teenage relationships with other teenagers and with adults. Now, I'm not going to give away whether the ending is happy or sad. It does fit with what came before. I am extremely happy with how the movie ends. There's no deus ex machina. There's no convenient writing at all. It's a very satisfying ending. Like, don't get me wrong. Some people, I'm not going to say whether it's sad or happy, but some people are not going to love the vibe that it leaves you with. Yeah. And, yeah, there are... As usual, two scenes, you know, by now we know that you know, it's an MCU movie. There's going to be two scenes after. There's a mid credit scene and a post credit scene. And they are both very worth staying through the end credits for. The movie never lost my interest. It never really felt like we were just, you know... Like, uh, just a, a slog, slog to get through, you know, the, it never felt like we were getting bogged down with something that had to be there, even though it wasn't particularly compelling for them to make a movie out of, or for us to watch movies. No, it was all very compelling. One critic said, when was the last time the third film in a franchise go to any audience is truly thrilled for what comes next? I mean, I can only speak for myself, but that's how I feel about every MCU third movie in a series, especially Iron Man 3, Civil War, Infinity War, but also Ragnarok, and I am this is... I can't really pick between Civil War and Infinity War, so those are tied for number one this one is an immediate second like it comes right after it's not quite as... what movie is as good as those anyway it comes extremely close to being as good as those now i think the movie uses the superpowers really well a lot of fun creative action Some say this is Tom Holland's best performance, and he really makes the character his own. I would have to agree. The, yeah, his, his, you know, like the movie gets a lot of mileage out of close-ups of his face when he's really acting, and yeah, like it's gonna, his, his, you know, expression 
yeah, it's gonna it's gonna stick with me. Now. And Zendaya does really great as well. It's hard to overstate the chemistry between Tom Holland, Zendaya, and Jacob Batalon. Like, they are so good together. And, like, it's, yeah, they're, they're just, honestly... Everything else in the movie is amazing, but hypothetically, if everything else in the movie was garbage, I would say it's worth watching the movie at least once just for those three together. Like, they're just, just, it, it gives you life, you know, like, it's just so invigorating, so, so much fun, the, the, like, you know, apparently, like, Tom and Jacob are friends in real life, and I heard that Tom and Zendaya are actually dating, so, you know, that helps, obviously, but they're just, they're so, yeah. Benedict Cumberbatch as Dr. Stephen Strange, like, he continues to be this, like, there's this, there's this good sort of, like, he's not completely, he's not always the most responsible, but he's also not just, like, completely, like, ah, what's the word? Someone, someone who has absolutely no, I mean, really, the, the, Tom Holland's Peter Parker keeps dealing with mentors who are, like, not quite, you know, they're not always quite as careful as they should be. Anyway. Yeah, Jacob Batalon does a really great job. And John Favreau as happy, like, sometimes we can kind of forget that, like, John Favreau He's, he's incredibly funny, and he is in this as well, but he is capable of drama as well. Like, he, he can give you a really strong, dramatic performance. That's, I think the movie does an incredible job balancing the drama and the comedy, because, like, sometimes MCU movies, I guess it's more frequently that there's too much comedy than, than there's too much drama, and, you know... There's definitely, yeah, but with this one, they just, they do an incredible job. <clears throat> and Marisa Tomei is also really great, again. <clears throat> I, let's see. <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> And, yeah, we get more of J.K. Simmons as J. Jonah Jameson, which, a lot of us were saying we're never going to get, it's, look, Spider-Man 3, a lot of frustrating aspects about that movie, definitely could have been a better movie. Man, it was good to, like, J.K. Simmons as J. Jonah Jameson still really brought it. He still had some really good material to work with. I don't know. I guess we're never going to... We're probably never going to get... Wrong! We did. They, they, they made it like... He's so good. He's so good in this. And he really just... He has... Like, it's a slightly different character. You know, this is still the... He's he's very Alex Jones in in this version, but he still has that that anger and bitterness and just resentfulness of Spider-Man, and just 
the the these this character assassination and and like he's trying to to make everyone hate Spider-Man. Yeah, they do a really great job. And he's like I mean, the man must be a bit up in years by now. It's it's very impressive that he's still, you know, for us, okay, he, you know, we just see the screen time that they put in the movie where he's like shouting and running and being really passionate. Dude's got to do that for hours at a time until they have all the coverage and, you know, just, yeah, it's, it's very impressive. Now, the, the characters in the movie behave both written and performed in a way that makes sense based on what we know about them and the movie doesn't like some of the characters are in slightly different situations than what we're used to and yeah the movie the movie isn't interested in just going back over stuff we've already seen you know this is the first time that the that that Peter and MJ are really in a relationship like in the first one they don't have that much like she you know she she certainly seems to pay a lot of attention to him but she swears she's not obsessed and then in the second one you know they're they're flirting and trying to like go on dates and and stuff like that but in this one like from the very start of the movie they are together they are a couple and yeah it's really great to see that and of course you know the old Parker luck of course that only happens right before everyone finds out his true identity and then a chunk of people believe that he killed Mysterio because that's the thing like no, far from everyone there's there's a good chunk of people who don't like come after him and say you murdered Mysterio and he was a hero but they're like, holy crap, he's a celebrity, you know. So there's like helicopters flying around out outside of the the his place, you know, and like everyone's trying to get a, you know, get some, get some video of him, and like they they, yeah, for a lot of for a lot of characters, yeah, a lot of the people you see in this movie, they kind of they don't act so much like, oh wow, this. Did he really murder someone? They they kind of more like, oh wow, that's totally you know like they're going, they're, they're kind of acting like paparazzi around celebrity or something you know, and yeah that that will make you miserable you know he's a teenager he has enough bad you know he has enough problems to deal with. Now. You know, I realized on, like, as I was thinking back over the movies, The Amazing Spider-Man 2 is the only live-action second Spider-Man movie in a continuity where Peter never loses any of his powers. Like, it happens in the Raimi ones, it happens in Far From Home. Yeah. It's just, it's a real popular thing. The second movie in a, it's, you know, the, the first sequel with the... Uh, What's it called? With a, with a superhero lead. The, the superhero loses at least some of his powers. <clears throat> now, the cinematography is handled by Mauro Fiore. And some of the movies that I've seen him DP are Dark Phoenix, the A-Team movie, Avatar, The Kingdom, The Island, Tears of the Sun, Training Day, and Get Carter. And, yeah, he does a really good job. Like, the, the cinematography keeps it easy to follow when something suddenly happens, like action scenes. And it doesn't have hyperactive cinematography when it should be more calm. Like, in, in dialogue scenes, the camera isn't going all over the place. And... Like, 
there are some action scenes in this that are like ridiculously big and the fact that the movie manages to keep like I don't think there was ever really a time where I was lost as to who's doing what or why and the editing uh, let's see yeah so the editing also works to keep it easy to follow fast moving scenes like action scenes and it keeps more calm when that is called for like at the the, the movie starts with the you know with with Peter and MJ in Times Square is that what it's called the the part of New York that you know it literally picks up right after like m seconds after the the mid credit scene yeah and just immediately you know everyone's freaking out in reaction to this revelation and so you know he tries to get MJ away from the crowd and tries to figure out where where can I go where where will we be safe you know and yeah so the the first several minutes of the movie are very chaotic and that makes perfect sense because it's it really is like it's it's stunning the the both like the, the movie, so it's it's told from Peter's perspective, so it's mostly his shock at it, but you know it's it's shock for everyone. So yeah, of course the, those are chaotic, but then a little later in the movie, you know, they're they're trying to figure out like they're they're having they're having conversations. Things have are a little more calm at least, so the scenes are less intense. The special effects are great. Like the yeah, it's not really a, a suppose that like the a lot of the best stuff. I really can't talk about without spoiling. Let me just say it. It looks incredible, and they use effects to accomplish things that I'm. I was really, really happy to see stuff that I've been wanting to see. In a Spider-Man movie for a long time, stunt work is also great. And let's see. the pacing is perhaps uneven. Now. Let's see the the length. Yeah, I did not note exactly. I think without end credits, it's about two hours and twenty minutes. Now, so let's see the. This is the part of of the review where I try to talk about what is what is the worst thing. Can I can I point to to something and say that is that is definitely the worst thing about this? Before that, you kind of need for there to be something truly negative. I'm just not sure I have much negative to say about this movie. Ah, let's see if I absolutely have to go out on a limb. Yeah, I just I don't I don't think I can really think of any. Yeah, the th for for sure the thing I was most worried about for, for this movie was that it would be so overstuffed that it would just be unbearable. Like I thought it was going to be way worse than Spider Man Three, and it's so much better and not just because the movie does not <sighs> this movie has no emo Peter and but that's not the only reason I was most looking forward to 
I don't want to say the nostalgia itself, but seeing how they fit together all these nostalgia, you know, the, the different parts of the, and yeah, the movie exceeded my expectations. And so, yeah, the, the cover and poster give away at least a little bit too much, and certainly the trailers do, but they do also give you a good idea of what the movie is like, so if you like them, very likely you'll like the movie as well. I have to say, I, I did not expect, this has a 94% on Rotten Tomatoes. I, I don't even know. I really thought this was going to be rated fairly low, and there would be a bunch of, like, reviews where it's just like, ah, it's nothing but fan service, which, for sure, I, that would, it, it would be a mistake if it was basically nothing but fan service, but no, they, yeah, the movie has a heart. There's 139 reviews, and only eight of them are rotten. So, yeah, certified fresh, and I forgot to copy in, I swear I won't spend forever on this, but I will just very briefly. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm just really quickly going to look the movie up on IMDb to see what the the rating is on there. Now it is 9.2 out of 10 based on 37,000 votes and I guess, ah, yeah, I also do not have, so let's see, the, the Metacritic, I will really, really quickly go and find, Okay, so on Metacritic, it has a 71 out of 100. So, that's at least a little bit less wild. And, yeah, this is capital C cinema. So, I... I give this eight multiverse crossover characters out of ten. Just like, you know, honestly, it's a it's not not devil horns, but like, you know, yeah, it's it's fantastic. And that brings us to the thoughts sections. Disclaimers. If you don't care about these disclaimers, try to keep them short and relevant, but your mileage may vary. You can skip right ahead to the relevant section of your choice in the description box. I often try to talk very fast during the disclaimers since a lot of it's very standard information. I'm not going to keep speaking as fast as I sometimes do during this section once I get into the rest of the video itself. And so yeah, from here on out, spoilers for every Spider-Man movie that has come out, including this one. And still the MCU leading up to this point, and including this one. The rest of this video is not a review. It's a series of, well, thoughts. Some of it's analysis, some of it's MSDC, Freya, Rift Jackson, other jokes. 
And yeah, the time codes for all the sections are in the description box. So the section right after this one is thoughts that I have while watching in chronological order. You can think of it as a running commentary, live tweeting, or the like. And let's see, I'm not 100% certain if I am going to do, if I'm going to separate, but there might be a section after that called, called thoughts at before watching. Now. I really appreciate that the movie has empathy for almost all, even the most, even, even the least likable of characters. I suppose the only, the only character in this that I would say it just has no empathy for is the goblin persona. You know, it has empathy for Norman Osborn, but not for the goblin persona. And ultimately, that was probably the right call. You know, the other villain characters do make at least some, you know, positive, dis they, they make some positive choices and such. Now, that brings us to notes taken while watching. I actually almost filled out an entire pad this time. All of these... yeah, it's been a while. Now... Let's see. So yeah, I, I liked how the, the movie, like, the public response, like, immediately goes completely out of control. And, you know, Peter swings away with MJ, and, you know, they gotta figure out where to, where to go, and, yeah. And, <laughs> Peter... Peter goes back into the, the you know, the, the apartment, you know, May's apartment through the window, and, you know, Happy hears it, and he's like, I, I gotta, you know, and, and May's like, no, 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 he, he comes and goes like that all the time, because, you know, by now, like, you know, a couple of movies ago, she heard a noise like that, she'd be like, what just happened? But now, you know, she's, she's comfortable with the fact that, he is Spider-Man, and she, you know, she fully supports that whole thing, you know. So they go in there, and, you know, the door opens, and I shouldn't find this so funny. It's it's such an it's such an old joke, but it just works. The you know they open the door, and MJ is standing there, and Peter's like half naked. And so, I, if I recall correctly, and, you know, at first, the, you know, they just, I, I forget if it's Happy or, yeah, I think, yeah, Happy was the one who opened the door and, and May sees in, and then Happy's like, oh, sorry, and then he closes the door because he's like, you know, oh, man, I would hate for my parental figure to catch me half naked with the girl I'm into, like, you know, so... And then, you know, and I think May, like, she, she just opens the door a little bit and she just yells in, Save sex! You know, and, and then, you know, and then she opens the door, You're MJ, hi, I'm May. And it's just like, that is, that is the perfect way to meet the per parental figure of the person you're dating. You know, just, and, and like, the, the, you know, Peter's, like, comes across as very nervous, and we know it's because he wants to keep, you know, he doesn't want May to freak out over the, the, his secret identity being revealed, and, yeah, May starts, so, why are you so nervous about, yeah, why are you so nervous about sex, or some, something like that, just, yeah. And let's see, um, 
I really liked the the scenes of damage control talking to May and you know all three of the teenagers. You know, I like the way that they approach them differently. Like when they're talking to like MJ, she sees right through them. You know, she's like, I'm not talking to you without a lawyer. And the guy's like, why would you need a lawyer unless you're guilty? And, you know, he doesn't even finish the sentence. You know, oh, unless I'm guilty. I know how you guys work, you know. And then, like, with Ned, he comes in. Oh, man. Oh, I'm so sorry. Can you, can you get some food for my friend Ned here? Oh, man. It's got to really suck. Like how MJ found out about it before you did? I mean, this is just, this is not okay, you know, and, and he's like, um, I knew before MJ, I've been his guy in the chair for years now, and then he's like, so you confess that you're his primary accomplice, that's, wow, and, like, with, with May, he's like, you, you know, aren't you ashamed of yourself? You're this parental figure and you, you know, you encourage this kind of behavior and just, yeah, it was, it was some really good scenes. And, you know, as many had guessed, that wasn't, that wasn't his arm in the trailer. But, yes, Matt Murdock is, in fact, Peter's lawyer in this. And, like, you know, he catches this thing and they're like, how did you do that? I'm a really good lawyer. <laughs> and, yeah. And, yeah, Peter and May move to a Stark safe house. And we meet Dummy again. It's just... have we, I, I don't think we've seen Dummy since Iron Man 3. So it really is great to, to have... Yeah. And and it's I I didn't note this chronologically, so I'm just gonna say it here. At one point, Dummy is over eager and accidentally smashes the the Lego Death Star that they built. I thought it was really adorable when MJ and Peter FaceTime and you know talk about the future and talk about you know what are his favorite things about her and yeah. I really appreciate that, you know, the movie pointed out there are some supporters of Spider-Man. You know, when he goes to school, like, some of them are in favor of him, but none of them, none of them leave him alone. And now Flash wants credit for being friends with Spider-Man. I think the movie could have done more with that. Ah. This movie couldn't have. There wasn't really room for more of that. But I do like... Like, this really is the first time we've seen a live-action, at least movie, I guess. Did, did they do that in the show? Anyway. Where the Flash character likes Spider-Man and then has to deal with the fact that the kid he usually bullies, Peter Parker, is actually Spider-Man. I liked the, let's see, yeah, the, the various, you know, the, the teacher, like, let's see, was it the, yeah, the gym teacher believes Mysterio and hates Peter, and the other two teachers, and, like, you know, one of them's like, okay, so the students built this thing, and one of them is, students did it, you built this thing, we kept trying to talk you out of it. And he's like, um, I just, you know, if you, if you want to spend some time really studying it, maybe taking in all the detail, you know, that, that'd be nice. It's, it's, it's I'm really going to miss. I, I mean, I guess we're probably not going to see, because the ending of this movie suggests that he's not attending the same school anymore, right? Or am I... Yeah, I, I, I'm going to miss him because he's really, he's he's a fun, he's a fun character. The actor does a really great job. Like, all three of these movies, he has memorable stuff. You know, in the, in the second one, there's the, the bit with the camera and just, we're sitting there like, 
dude, it's gonna fall, it's gonna fall, you're gonna lose your ca- you, you lost your camera. You know, and in the first one, there's that, you know, he's, he's like being interviewed, and he's like, I'm so glad Spider-Man showed up. I, you know, I could not bear to lose a student on a field trip again. And Peter, Ned, and MJ check their MIT letters at the same time, and all of them find they, they can't go because of the controversy. And, yeah, they, you know, Peter goes to Doctor Strange very early in the film because you know, it's what we're here for, you know, we, yeah, we, we're not here for, for him to mope over paparazzi for forever. And we're, you know, we find out why the there's that much snow. You know, some people had theorized, I, I don't know if they were particularly serious, but, you know, maybe there's still a hole in the ceiling from Infinity War. But, yeah, we find out Wong is actually Sorcerer Supreme, and there was a, a blizzard, and, yeah. I like that... Peter suggests time travel, and Strange has to explain that's why that's not going to work. Because that is, like, the idea that using magic would make everybody forget Peter Parker or Spider-Man. That's like, like, yeah, it's it's just, your mind would go to, to time travel first. In the trailer... Wong said, Strange, don't cast that spell. And Strange goes like, sure, wink. Oh, am I am I winking with my wrong eye? Anyway. And the And then he still does it, but then in this he says, Leave me out of it. So that's an interesting Yeah, I I don't know exactly how I feel about that. I mean, ultimately, both of them are kind of frustrating characterization-wise. <sighs> yeah. I will say, like, this movie did a good job of selling, like, Strange basically feels like Wong is constantly undercutting him. It's like, I was supposed to be Sorcerer Supreme. You're only Sorcerer Supreme because of this technicality. And you screwed up about the blizzard, you know, and Wong's like, I, I, I can't hear you. I'm all the way up here above you. It's just, you know, your tiny, tiny voice can't reach me all the way up here. So Strange is, is frustrated. And I, based on the trailers, it looked like the problem was that Peter was distracting Strange so that he accidentally messed up, but in the movie, he actually adjusts the spell to go with what Peter suggests. And because he makes so many adjustments, that's why it fails. Would you just stop talking? If the world might end because a teenager would not stop talking, yeah, I, I, we're, we're, we're doomed. I kid. I have a lot of empathy for teenagers. I like that, you know, when, when Peter walks in, he's like, Sir, please, we, we saved the uni half the universe together. I think we're beyond you calling me, sir. And then, I think, yeah, he calls him Steven. And uh, feels weird, but all loud. And then after the spell goes wrong, says, Steven, no, call me, sir. And... You know, and, and, and Peter looks up in the sky and it's like, that black helicopter has been following me all day. And I, I really like that, you know, Strange is like, wait, wait, you're saying you went to me for a spell to brainwash everyone on Earth before you tried to appeal their decision? And he's like, I didn't know I could do that. Out leave and you know he's there to, to plead and 
Doc Ock shows up. I really appreciate... Yeah, Doc Ock gets a great intro. Everyone in this gets a great intro. Like, it's, it's, it's wild. No one gets, like, just a boring intro. Just show up without without getting to do something extremely cool. Anyway, so, you know, in the other movies, uh, movie, last time we saw Alfred Molina as Doc Ock, his arms, sometimes were, they were CG, but a lot of the time they were puppeteered. And now that it's full CG, there's no puppeteering of the arms in this movie. That means that they can, you know, and I, I think in both cases they made the right choice. The CGI wasn't convincing enough in 2004, and today it's just the, the things they can do with these action scenes, it's just, it's too big for puppeteering to really cut it. And yeah, they do some really cool stuff in this that you would never be able to do if you were puppeteering, you know, how he, like, breaks through, let's see, did he start from under the bridge, or am I... Yeah, yeah, I, th I feel like he, you know, he he shoved some cars out of the way and then lifted himself up onto the bridge. You know, that was really cool. But, and in general, the entire bridge scene was really cool and reminded me somewhat of Mace Spider-Man 1, where it's Lizard and Spider-Man on the bridge. And I, I really liked, you know, a lot of people noted, oh, you know, it's like Stark tech, there's like nano tech on Doc Ock's arms, and yeah, it's the, it's Peter's suit that, you know, leaves, yeah, leaves his suit and goes on to the arms, and then Peter gets control of them, and he dis, you know, he, he takes control, and, and like, in, in Spider-Man 2, you know, near the end, Doc Ock, you know, takes over control of the pie, saying, Listen to me now. And then when, when Peter takes over, you know, he's like, no, listen to me, not don't listen to him. That was a, that was a neat little callback as a yeah. And and Peter's like, oh, oh, <laughs> like a like a kid with a new toy. It's it's really funny. You know, he he doesn't just say, Ah, you see, I have taken over the situation for I can no, he's like, Oh check out what I can make do. Just and Goblin shows up. I, I really appreciate that that bit is cut short. I could not I guess that might actually be one of the things where like that was supposed to go at least slightly differently and they had to change it because of production issues. Because it was it was a little bit weird, but you know, strange you know, he does the wrist shooter thing so that Spidey can grab villains and just put them in cells immediately which I I'm really glad that it did like when they I forget exactly you know when when they talked about and and they basically said okay so we have to go out there and find all of these bad guys bring them back here I was like oh no this is gonna be like the next it's it's gonna be a long chunk of the movie and we're just gonna see you know, I love these action scenes, but they would get tedious if it was all of it. No, you know, they actually, they spend very little time. They they very quickly get, you know. And, yeah, Electro in the woods and Sandman. I really appreciate that Sandman starts out helping, you know, because he's like, oh, you're Spider-Man. Yeah, I, you know, I want to help you. I'm... Because that's the last thing he remembers from his own universe. He's he's a little confused about where he is, and Spider-Man looks a little different now. But no, it's, you know, he's he's gonna help him. And so we see Sand and Electricity interact because you know in Spider-Man Three we see Sandman interacting with water and with fire, and and a goblin grenade hit you know blows up part of him. But before this movie, we hadn't seen him interact with electricity, so that's quite cool. And I'm not saying everything was perfect when it comes to May and Norman and how, I mean, essentially, 
if I recall, the, the term now is unhoused. Homeless is now considered a slur, which, I mean, considering all the, the terrible things that have been said about them, you can understand why it's... So, so yeah, Norman is basically an unhoused individual, you know, and, and I mean, that is what Goblin does to him, you know, the, the, this is not, ah, what's the word? I mean, he literally says, some, I'm confused, sometimes I don't know where I am. Sometimes I'll wake up and I don't know where I am. You know, this literally is something that actual unhoused individuals. So, so there's like, I mean, on the one hand, there are at least, there's a little bit of stuff where it's a, like, the unhoused are not dangerous. You know, they're not dangerous to the, the average person. They're, they're more likely to be victims than perpetrators so it's a little messed up to take one of the villains and do that but on the other hand it really is like the the kind of thing the there's there there are parallels there you know the way that because norman and and goblin and this are the way that they were in the original sam raimi spider-man movie and that movie doesn't draw that parallel, but this movie does. You know, he goes to see May, and yeah, he seems like like if you didn't know, if if Peter entered the scene not knowing, then you wouldn't think you you'd just think, oh, it's it's another unhoused individual. You know, maybe May can help her, help him. And, I mean, Norman legitimately ex describes existential dread. And May says that Peter should help. You know, she doesn't use the word villain, but yeah, help the villains. And I really appreciate that they, you know, they lean, the movie leans into the J. Jonah Jameson as Alex Jones, you know. He's, he literally advertises for daily vitamin supplement or wh whatever they were called, you know, which that is, yeah, that is something that Alex Jones peddles. And I like that, you know, Peter wants to save the, the villains and Strange says it can't be done. The mirror dimension stuff. Holy crap, that was amazing. I really appreciate that we got more of that. And it was like, you know, they, they made the Doctor Strange solo movie, and I was like, okay, so, do you like this? Audience, let us know, you know, put your opinion on the internet. Let us know, would you like to see more of that? You know, that's why, like, if you, ju if you go back and watch Doctor Strange, it's actually not that huge of a chunk of the movie. Like, yeah, there's, there's a lot of magic use, but, like, some of it, you know, we get, like, a training montage, and we get, like, you know, the, the, yeah, actually, the, the Dormammu bargaining bit, that's also a montage, you know, it's, we're seeing outlandish things, but they're presented in a way that we're more likely to accept. The one part is this short bit where, you know, she... Well, what is it? She 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 opens his eye. I think she is how she puts it, you know. And yeah, like for that bit, it really, you know, yeah, briefly there, you see all this crazy stuff, but it doesn't actually take up a lot of screen time. And here, like, yeah, there's several minutes of just mirror dimension stuff, and it's because we said we wanted more, and now we got more. And Peter uses math to defeat it. It's so clever, because, like, I really love how this, like, you can, you can drop Peter, you can drop Tom Holland's Peter Parker in a ridiculous situation, and he'll try to make sense of it, you know, he, like, he tries to figure out, like, he points out that Steve Rogers' shield does not obey the laws of physics at all, and, you know, Bucky, like, you know, hits him, he's like, 
oh, dude, you have a metal arm, you know, and then there's like, wait, is, is the mirror dimension just geometry? I know geometry. Okay, think Peter, think pi and the, and he, he caught Doctor Strange in an actual spider's web. That's such a great, yeah. And I, you know, in The Amazing Spider-Man 2, Sony was terrified of the prospect of Electro Dong, so they gave him the ability to generate clothing. Not so in this movie, and they just, like, for, for a little bit, he's just standing there, and none, no, one, no one is saying anything, and then, like, the, the, let's see, I think, yeah, eventually Electro's like, are you really gonna pretend like I'm not standing here naked? And Sandman's like, yeah, I, I am, I am going to, you know, and, and, yeah. And I really like, you know, Peter goes and gets the Stark Fabricator and uses it to help the, the villains. May May is so precious. She she offers Doc Ock some some water, and then she asks, "Fresh or salt?" I, what? You know, salt water, because you're an octopus. I'll I'll, I'll get you some fresh water. <laughs> And he's just completely confused at, at the whole, yeah. I liked seeing Electro and Sandman turn, you know, deciding to, to do, because they, they want to stay. And, you know, Peter puts in the new chip. It works. Ock is back to normal. I really appreciate that, you know, later he pretends he's uh, gonna do evil, but he's really just making sure that, you know, the, that the spider, spider's man can stop. I want to say it was Electro at that point. I really liked Goblin's monologue as they're, you know, turning on... Peter and May says you know like the the moment she started I was like she's gonna do it she's actually gonna say with great power comes great responsibility and I mean at that point I'm, I'm sorry May but rules are rules you you can't survive giving that kind of speech you you, you have to die very soon after giving that speech I don't know, maybe she OD'd on Spider-Man film references. But it, it is good, like, in the comics, she also dies not long after his identity is revealed. It's different circumstances, but, you know, that that is one of the things that we were worried about. Like, is she going to die? Like, you know, yeah. And, let's see. Yeah, and MJ wants to press the box, and Ned starts using magic. I really liked, you know, like, he's, he said it. He said it to Strange. You know, he's like, D -d do you think I'm magic? He's like, uh, you should see his physician about that. And he's like, uh, he's, oh, it worked. Um, Peter Parker. You know, and just... And, and, like, it's such a great, because, like, Ned and MJ are like, is that, oh, yeah, uh, Peter, come here. Oh, no, never mind, never mind, just stay away, you know. It's like, no, no, it's okay, you know, and he, he goes through, and he takes the mask off, like he does, you know, Andrew Garfield does, like he does in the first Amazing Spider-Man movie when he's trying to calm down the kid in the car. You know, so that's a great, it's just... And it's such a clever, because, like, why could Peter find the evil people who went through the portal? Well, because they started doing evil stuff, you know? Like, they go through the portal, and they start, like, 
attacking, you know, so, yeah, Peter found them through that. But what are the spider, the, the other two Spider-Men, what are they going to, like, there's, they, they don't know about Doctor Strange or the Avengers, so they can't go to Bleecker Street or the, you know, an Avengers building or something. They don't have a bat signal. What are they supposed to do? So they just, they go around looking for them, and eventually Ned opens portals to where they are. And, and yeah, not long after we have both of the old Spider-Men, and it's that kind of thing. We haven't, before this movie, we haven't seen Tobey Maguire play Spider-Man since 2007. So that's 14 years. That's a lot. That's longer than he played the character. So, you know, it could, like, I, I don't like the ones where they bring back someone when they're, like, really old and you get, like, I'm not, I'm not saying there's something wrong with old people. I'm saying... If you bring back a character when the actor is old and the actor, like, you get the sense that, oh, they're, like, they're not okay anymore. Like, they're, they're, you know, age has really taken a toll on them, you know. Then it's like, oh, no, I don't want to, I don't want to see that. Like, everybody ages, but I don't, you know, that's just, that's, it just hurts to watch someone you really care about deteriorate but no that like toby like you know it's not it's not like it would be ridiculous to say oh it feels like he never stopped it feels like he just yesterday no no, no. time has passed but they don't like they, they lean into that they're like you know yeah it was a while ago since last you know he yeah he talks about like it was a while ago that you know harry tried to kill me for example and you know but yeah and and like Andrew Garfield like it does kind of feel like it uh, and it, uh, it hasn't been that long either has it seven years I guess yeah so but yeah and and the bit <laughs> you know he's he's like no no, no it's, it's okay it's just, well you I threw a I threw bread at you you didn't react like a spider sense I have a spider sense. It just doesn't work for bread, you know. It's like, okay, so so prove your spider. -Man. Prove him. Okay, okay, you know. And he like attaches and crawl on the on the ceiling. No. C crawl on the ceiling. Prove to me that you're Spider Man. Th this doesn't prove. This is enough. This is that is not enough. You know that was that was a really funny, and I really liked how like, you know the the. The way that they find Tom Holland again is that, you know, they talk about does he have some place that he really loves, to, you know, where that has, you know, can you think of somewhere that he would go for, for really, you know, yeah. And, and one of them is like, oh yeah, you know, I, I loved going to the, what's it, the Chrysler building. And the, the other's like, oh, I, I preferred the, the Empire State building. Oh yeah, that place has a great view because, you know, they. If you're Spider-Man, no way, no way are you not going to the tops of various New York toll. You know, because Peter Parker, Spider-Man, lives and operates out of New York, so of course he's gonna go to the top of skyscrapers and like check out the view and so, so that's a great and yeah so they find him and let's see the, um, yeah and they yeah they they managed to find tom on the roof and he's crying because it's a spider-man movie seriously though that really like they haven't been too, like, excessive with it in the Tom Holland movies. He barely cried at all in Homecoming, now that I think about it. 
and far from home he was grieving so fair enough it, it, yeah here he's grieving as well so you know but yeah they, there was definitely a lot of crying in the other two spider-man movies and you know they talk about revenge and what does that say they talk about right um I think it was Andrew Garfield who talks about having he it made him bitter for a while having lost. I'm not 100% certain why they decided that like Andrew Garfield would spend almost like I think at one point he like puts a lab coat over it but otherwise he's like always wearing the Spider-Man suit. I mean which which you know that's fine. Meanwhile, Tobey Maguire is in, like, civilian clothing, so I, I don't know what the... Because he has his suit, and at, at one point they're like, did you bring your suit? Or did... What, is it, what, what did they say he looks like? A... Act. Ah, I, I don't remember. It was funny, though. I remember laughing at it, but yeah. I mean... I don't... I hope the following doesn't sound mean, because I do really like Andrew Garfield's Spider-Man, and I think his passion for the character comes through in his performance in all three of these movies. I can't rule out maybe the reason Andrew Garfield wore the, the Spider-Man suit throughout all of his scenes in this movie is that that was his one request that was just one condition you know they were like we're putting the band back together and he's like well and he's like mentally doing a happy dance but he's like trying to play cool i get to wear the suit oh well, yeah i mean it's a, it's a spider man of course you're gonna wear the suit all of my screen time I get to wear the suit non-stop. I never wear anything else. Maybe a lab coat. Never wear anything. Uh, uh, drape the lab coat over the Spider-Man suit. Deal. Now, I've... I kind of loved seeing just three Peter Parkers three spiders man just working on solving the villain's problem you know that's just like that's spider-man you know it's there's three of them this time but yeah he's he's literally trying to save the bad guys and they talk about love lives like uh, let's see. I forget exactly. I, I don't remember exactly how it goes, but like, yeah, they they you know Garfield and McGuire briefly talk about you know oh you know is there even there's probably not even time for that kind of thing we you know we have other we have too many other things you know. And, yeah, Tom Holland's Peter Parker goes to the Statue of Liberty and, like, FaceTimes J. Jonah Jameson to lure the bad guys there, and it works. I really like the bonding between the three spiders, man, and I, <laughs> I don't think I noticed, so I'm a little bit out of order here, but there's a bit where, like, they're talking about teamwork, and, like, Tom Holland goes, well, you know, I don't want to brag, but I just want to bring up, you know, I was a member of the Avengers, and they're just like, that's so cool, that's so nice for you. What does that mean? <laughs> oh, they're, uh, they're, like a, they're like a band, you know, because cause they, like, they're not used to their being other good guys with superpowers like if you know if, in their movies if you have a if you have a superpower you're either spider-man or you're a villain 
So they have no frame of reference for this, and that's, yeah. Now, the, the climax is amazing. I like the depiction of, like, there's, there's definitely some jokes about it, but, like, largely the movie says, you know, it is a good thing for men to be friends with each other. And... Yeah, I, I really appreciate it. Like, at first, basically all three Spider-Men act like they're alone on this. You know, they're, they're not good at this teamwork thing. And I, I really liked how, like, it seemed like they were getting everything under control. You know, they managed to unevilify the, you know, most of the villains, and then Goblin shows up and destroys everything. I like that he was the one, like, it is kind of, everything starts with him and ends with him. He's, there is a Green Goblin, technically, the only reason there's a Green Goblin in the Tom Holland movies is because he traveled over. But there is a Green Goblin in all three of these, you know. So, the, the you know, com yeah, comparatively, like, they could have had a Doc Ock in The Amazing Spider-Man 1 or 2, but they didn't. You know, the, the only... Yeah, The Amazing Spider-Man 2 has two Green Goblins, and then this one, yeah, it's because they brought him over, but still, he's there, you know, so the first Spider-Man movie ends with Tobey Maguire getting his ass beaten by Green Goblin, and this movie ends with Tom Holland, who is a stronger, you know, they, they've made him really, really strong. Some people think too strong. Anyway, the, the, yeah, there's a, there's a, ah, what's the word? Yeah, so Tom, yeah, this movie ends with Tom Holland beating Goblin. And, yeah, so, yeah, the, Goblin blows up the, the box and MJ falls, and, like, when Tom was not able to catch her, I seriously thought, holy crap, they're actually gonna kill her. But then, Garfield managed to, to catch her, and, yeah, you know, he, he got some, some catharsis there. He managed to save, you know, and she's like, I'm okay, are, are you okay? <laughs> but yeah, that's, that's a, a good, yeah. I really appreciate that Goblin was saved for last, that he doesn't, yeah, and, yeah, Toby stops Tom from killing Goblin, and then Goblin stabs Toby, just, yeah, he's just, he's so vicious, and I love it. The, the, uh, there was a thing I want to say real quick. Wait, let's see if I forget. Uh, let's see. Hmm. Let's see. Yeah, and I. I guess I'm not hugely surprised that we didn't see Kirsten Dunst as Mary Jane in this. You know, obviously Emma Stone's Gwen Stacy is dead, so you know we're not going to see her. The the it only brought. Although I mean, the spell brought through people who knew that Peter Parker was actually Spider-Man, even the ones who had died. So it would have made sense. They could have reasoned that. But, I mean, Emma Stone, she's a big deal. I, I wouldn't, I don't blame her for not, like, showing up for a cameo or something. But, 
it, it is a little bit like, you know, the women have played, the, Peter's love interests have played large roles in these movies. I don't think that they gave Kirsten Dunst enough strong material. It's, you know, ultimately it was still like, we just, we were supposed to care mostly about whether or not she ended up with Peter. But, like, all of these villains and both of the Peters, like, they could have spared a little bit of time for, you know, the two MJs to meet, for, for Gwen to show up and, like, try to instill upon Michelle, you know, like, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I think it would have been good if that had been part of it anyway and yeah so you know strange tells tom yeah that you know it's it's not gonna the spell that we tried isn't gonna work and so tom suggests what about if everyone forgets peter parker and that's you know that's the sacrifice he makes and i do appreciate you know at the end of the day like the fact that all of these came through is in part his, like, if he had accepted how bad things had gotten, you know, then it would be. But no, he had to go and try to, to change things, and now it ended up like this, so you can understand why he, yeah. Right, I also I also wanted to note that I really appreciate that May, even after she realized like she's she's badly hurt and she's still like this was we did the right thing, you know, this was worth it. I really appreciate that more recently these movies try to make it like I don't I don't love that apparently we are going to keep having movies Spider Man movies where a woman that's important to Peter dies. You know, the some writers seem to think that the most no, there's nothing more important a woman could possibly die do than die. You know, but if we are going to keep having that, I do at least appreciate these movies trying to make it, trying to give them some agency, trying to make it that they chose to do something knowing that they could get hurt rather than just their helpless victims so yeah you know in in this you have may still saying no what we did was the right thing to do and you know in amazing spider-man 2 you have gwen say nobody makes yeah what was it nobody makes my decisions for me nobody when, you know, like, in in the three Raimi ones, like, yeah, you know, the, the love interest or potential love interest of Peter, you know, oh, watch out, she's in danger, you know, that's, that's basically, yeah, I'm not saying it was the absolute only thing they did with those characters. But it did legitimately seem like that was, like, like that was the, the thing, if, if, they, if they wanted to do something really exciting or interesting with the character, it was basically, it would, it would usually be that. And I, I thought it was very moving, like, MJ is desperate to not lose Peter you know she she says you have to go and remind me you know yeah remind me who you are and you know we see some portal portal stuff opening with people who know Peter Parker and I'm almost 100% certain uh, no yeah know that Peter Parker is actually Spider-Man I'm almost certain that some of them are Craven and Rhino, so that's really cool. And 
yeah, Peter goes to, to tell Mary Jane, and he can't quite do it. You know, she's so excited about MIT, and it's it's very, it's a wonderful life. And let's see, there was a thing. Right, I, I liked how, like, you know, the, the spell is done, and then at first, you know, you just hear J. Jonah Jameson say, now, it has been several weeks since the Statue of Liberty debacle. And, you know, at first you're like, oh, did the, did the spell not work? But then he goes on to say, and we still don't know who Spider-Man is. So, yeah, the spell worked. And it's a Spider-Man movie, so you gotta have a graveyard, you know. Some, someone has been buried and, you know, a, a Peter is brooding at a graveyard. I, th I thought it was very, like, you know, Happy goes to, to May's grave and he doesn't recognize Peter. And, yeah, it's... And, you know, Peter goes to live in an apartment and... I think they maybe thought that the the specific like the the voice and dialect and such would be too racist to do, but it has to be like when you know the the guy says something like the you have to pay the rent on the exact day. That's definitely a reference to Mr. Ditkovich. You know, there's there's no way because they didn't have to have. A line there at all like we get it oh he's going into a new place yeah it's an apartment building he's moving in we're not you know we can put two and two together but no we get the you know rent is brought up and the idea that rent has to be paid on time is brought up and it's a spider-man yeah it's definitely a, a mr. Ditkovich reference and just yeah I'm here for it and let's see. Yeah, and so the very last thing we see is him swinging through the city. So it's a it's a bittersweet ending. It's not Spider-Man is gone, but it is Peter Parker has suffered a great loss. And I think this one does a much better job of juggling those, you know, like, yeah, making it clear that Peter has really lost something and is in pain, but he's still going to be Spider-Man much better job at that than The Amazing Spider-Man 2. And let's see, there's another thing. I, I really love that there's basically, like, they could go anywhere with Spider-Man now. Like, I mean, I feel like the, the let, let me just get the most boring out of the way. They could just have Peter feel really strongly about it, go and and tell Ned and MJ, and they have the trio back, and maybe gradually he tries to reconstruct a life that looks like the one in these three movies, or, yeah, the first two movies, really. But more interestingly, they could basically go any direction, like, the... the you know he could he could try to stay con completely incognito, and there could be some conflict from that. He could try to create a new life, meet new people, not ones that he already had a relationship with. It's, yeah, there's there's so many different places to go with this. It's it's yeah. So the mid credit scene, we see that Venom. You know, he's had the MCU explained for hours, and, like, he's headed to New York, and then apparently, like, kicked out of the MCU by Strange's spell, and, yeah, you know, I, I think it was, was it maybe, ah, let me think, Screen Rant, I want to say? who pointed out that it's it's very in character for the Tom Hardy Venom to be such a screw up that he goes to the MCU and then he wastes all this time he he gets drunk and is 
you know, he gets the MCU storyline explained to him, you know, the the big purple alien who really likes rocks and the the you know, Hulk and Iron Man and such. And then he just gets yeeted back out without accomplishing anything. So yeah, and, and it is like I mean it looks like the, the a tiny little bit is left behind. Very and and we see specifically, you know, for, at first it's just like lying there, but then like it moves a little bit. They're 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 looking to do. I don't know for one hundred percent certain if they are going to do, but they're looking to do black suit Spider Man leading into Venom and. I mean, it is kind of ridiculous that they tried to do Venom without. I mean, it's going to be kind of weird if they just try to bring Tom Hardy in after Tom Holland has run around with Black Suit Spider-Man for a while. But, you know, I, I don't know if that's exactly what that... I, I don't think Venom is that interesting if he didn't start out as being Peter, Peter Parker's Spider-Man suit. It's just, that's, a, a lot of the most interesting stuff comes from his connection to Spider-Man, so. But, yeah, it looks like they might actually try to, you know, I mean, based, certainly, according to Venom Let There Be Carnage, the Venom symbiote feels, like, he, he feels a certain sense, it's important to him what happens to his offspring, so, yeah, that might be, you know, he might look at Black Suit Spider-Man as, you know, another, yeah, son or, or something. So, anyway. And the post credit scene is a fairly straightforward tease for Doctor Strange 2. But, yeah, looks great. We see Strange. We see um, Wanda. We see Strange Supreme cannot wait to see more of Strange Supreme and I forget his name but the yeah the villain from the the first one the the sorcerer villain from the first one and yeah it looks great I I'm I'm so psyched I it's it's yeah so psyched for that movie now I did have a couple of other things things yeah I'm just gonna I'm not gonna make another section here so let's see one of the trailers showed MJ falling and Tom Holland's Peter, yeah, the trailers didn't give away that there were other Peters, except for that bit where, like, you could see where they were supposed to be. Anyway, MJ falls, Tom Holland's Peter tries to, to catch her before she falls, before she, you know, dies from the fall. When I watched Raimi's Spider-Man 1, I was 100% certain that the movie was not going to have MJ fall. When I watched The Amazing Spider-Man 2, I was almost 100% certain that she was going to fall. I, I would have been extremely surprised if that movie ended without killing Gwen Stacy. When I watched this movie, I legitimately did not know if they were actually going to have her, you know, die. Yeah, fall, fall and die, or if, if they were going to be able to save her, you know. Obviously, I always cared about the the concept of whether or not she might, you know, die. It, it, regardless of the circumstance, it would be incredibly sad if she did. Now, you know, and, and sure, there are a number of MCU movies that don't have an important character that you didn't think would die, die, but some of them do now right and in the in one of the trailers you know goblin tells peter the world tries to force him to choose which 
yeah, you know, that is, like, in the first Spider-Man movie, he is trying to force him to make a difficult choice like that. So now he says, you know, the world is. So, yeah, that was really clever. And let's see. Yeah, I saw a, one critic suggest that the movie would end on a cliffhanger, which, I mean, yeah, uh, I suppose... No, no, I technically it's not quite a cliffhanger. I I would say that critic was wrong about their prediction. Anyway, that is everything that I had to say. So, if you like this video, please comment, thumbs up, subscribe, hit that little bell. There should be a link to my main channel page, one, two or more links to stuff like relevant playlists, a suggested view of rewatch on the screen right about now. I put out one vlog per week reviewing and sharing spoiler thoughts on the movie and one talking about the most recent episode of the current Disney Plus MCU show these days. That is Hawkeye. The Hawkeye video might come out one or two days after this video comes out. And recently, the review and thoughts videos tend to come out very similar to this one. In other words, if you want more videos like this, you're in luck. You can check out my back catalog as well as catch my video next week. I hope you enjoyed watching as I enjoyed watching and recording. I'll catch you next time.